Hello and welcome. Today we're going to be talking about indigenous knowledge organization systems. Before we get started, we'd like to go over some of the terminology we'll be using so you know the terms and what they mean. The words we use matter, whether we're describing a single information resource or describing an entire knowledge organization system, so it's important to be clear about what words we'll be using and what they mean. You will notice that this is a common theme throughout indigenous knowledge organization systems. With that said, let's get started. Daniel Jodre and Arlene Taylor define a KOS, or Knowledge Organization System, as a generic term for all types of schemes for organizing information, including classification schemes, categories, authority files, subject heading lists, thesauri, and ontologies. As list professionals, we know that these socially constructed systems have biases and implications that extend beyond libraries, archives, and museums. Before we can begin to discuss indigenous knowledge systems, we must first look at the word indigenous. Most dictionaries, like the OED, define indigenous as of, relating to, or intended for, a native, for the native inhabitants. The United Nations offers a more contextual understanding of the term indigenous. Spread across the world from the Arctic to the South Pacific, indigenous peoples are commonly understood as descendants of the Earth's original land stewards living in a geographic region at a time when people of different cultures or ethnic origins arrived and later became dominant through conquest, occupation, and settlement. There are over 476 million indigenous peoples living around the world today. As with any word attempting to identify a diverse group of people, this general term is limited and often contentious. The United Nations acknowledges that it cannot define indigenous peoples. Instead, it seeks to identify indigenous peoples based on their self-identification, historical continuity to pre-colonial and or pre-settler societies, links to territories and surrounding natural resources, distinct social, economic, and political systems, and possession of distinct languages, cultures, and beliefs. Indigenous knowledge organization systems, then, are those schemes that seek to organize indigenous peoples' ways of knowing. Because of the diversity of indigenous peoples, indigenous knowledge cannot be reduced to a single characterization. Doing so would flatten nuanced and multifaceted identities and forms of knowledge. However, in very broad terms, indigenous knowledge is often described as holistic, interrelational, interactional, and broad-based. It is an emergent field in library science and is part of a broader global effort to name and reclaim indigenous knowledge. Given this definition of indigenous knowledge organizational systems, we might wonder why mainstream systems such as LC subject headings, LC classification system, and the Dewey Decimal System are unable to properly do justice to these indigenous materials. Since these systems claim to provide a universal hierarchical structure for all possible topics, we need to think about how they might distort or prove to be insufficient for the needs of indigenous materials. Broadly speak speaking, then, the problem is that DDC, LCCS, and LCSH are biased towards a predominantly white, Christian, and Eurocentric perspective. This isn't all that surprising, considering that this is the context out of which they emerged. However, we can break down the specific problems into three broad categories. First, there are worldview problems that make DDC, LCCS, and LCSH inappropriate for indigenous materials. All three take a hierarchical view of the world, one that is vastly different from the relational view of the world that is present in many indigenous cultures. For example, in mainstream KOS, it is normal to divide religion and literature into separate topics that are treated differently and distinctly. For instance, LC houses religion in the Bs and literature in the Ps. Or to take another example, it is common in these mainstream systems to keep materials on spiritual health separate from materials on physical health. The problem is that indigenous cultures often don't subscribe to these hierarchical divisions of knowledge, and instead topics like religion and literature and spiritual and physical health are closely related and in many cases inseparable. Second, 
There are classification problems with LCCS and Dewey. For instance, LCCS places most works on Native American indigenous cultures into the narrow range between E75 and E99, and Dewey places most of these works in 970.00497. However, these sections are primarily organized by geographical area as determined by Western nation states. Furthermore, in Dewey, most indigenous materials are placed under the category of ethnic and national groups, which falls under the general topical area for history of North America. But what this does is separate indigenous peoples from the greater history of North America and treat their culture as primarily a historical artifact. Not only that, but by putting the majority of works on the indigenous peoples of North America in these narrow classifications, it puts a wide variety of kinds of topics, such as art, culture, history, and politics, all into the same catch-all bucket. The effect is that mainstream classification is generally non-specific and doesn't show much of the relationships between individual tribal groups or the individual features of them. Then there are also the terminological issues. For instance, Indian is the main subject heading in LC. SH, and this is narrowed by geographical area, such as Indians of North America. Specific tribal nations are organized regionally as subdivisions by U.S. state, even though these nations are not geographically confined to a single U.S. state. This also further obscures the commonalities that might exist between indigenous groups, such as those between their culture, governance, and history, to name a few. And lastly, the terms in LCSH are exonyms, or names that are used by outsiders rather than self-identifications. The classic example of this is the subject heading of Ojibwa, a term that is not used by self-identifying indigenous peoples, who use Anishé Nabe. In these many different ways, we can see how mainstream knowledge organizational systems are insufficient for these indigenous peoples. So, because we have all these issues with mainstream knowledge organization systems, there are a handful of things to keep in mind when you're involved in creating or using an indigenous knowledge organization system. The first and most important consideration is, perhaps obviously, including indigenous people in the project, especially in leadership positions. When people have a say in how their community is represented, they will have better and stronger representation. A study in Canada, for example, found that wiki projects attempting to document and categorize indigenous knowledge were far more successful when they were initiated from within the community, because people felt a sense of ownership over the process and how their culture was represented. Community involvement also helps protect indigenous knowledge because many cultures have different ideas about knowledge ownership, what is considered common knowledge, what knowledge belongs to specific groups or families, and what knowledge is sacred and should only be known by elders. This is especially important in indigenous communities who have already experienced loss of land and culture due to colonization and whose knowledge is one of the few cultural properties they have left. It's also important to include people who are considered authorities on that culture's worldview, which in many indigenous cultures are community elders, into the process. As Nicholas mentioned, mainstream knowledge organization systems have a very Eurocentric perspective. The developers of the Manitoba Archival Information Network headings found that many librarians and archivists had difficulties describing indigenous information resources because of this. Another really important consideration is how the culture you're attempting to describe views their own world and the relationships between subjects such as people, the environment, and culture. As Stacy will explain to you, knowledge organization systems created by indigenous people, such as the Brian Deere classification system, visualize subject classification through that indigenous lens to provide more appropriate terminology and topic groupings. An example of an indigenous KOS is the Brian Deere classification system. Though it is called a system, BDC is more of a subject-based classification framework or foundation that institutions adapt for their collections. The BDC centers First Nations knowledge, terminology, and communities. It emphasizes relationships between and among people, animals, and the land. The BDC was originally developed in 1974 by Ganawagai librarian Brian Deere when he cataloged a research collection for the National Indian Brotherhood which is now known as the Assembly of First Nations. Deere then went on to adapt this classification scheme for each collection he worked on 
Several institutions in North America have adapted BDC for their own indigenous collections. One notable example is the Wewa Library. The Wewa Library is one of eight academic libraries on the University of British Columbia's Vancouver campus. The word Wewa means echo, and the mission of the library is to echo the voices and philosophies of Aboriginal people through its services, collections, and programs. The library's IKOS has been developed over time and continues to be refined and revised as resources and new research become available. It is considered a leader in Indigenous academic librarianship. Currently, the collection contains approximately 12,000 items. Librarian Ann Doyle explains that WIWA demonstrates the value of Indigenous research by making it visible and discoverable. The WIWA uses its own classification scheme. It is an adaptation of BDC that centers British Columbia's First Nations, and there are approximately 203 First Nations in British Columbia. WIWA's classification is guided by principles of collocation, specificity, and relevance. Over a two-year period, the library's collection was mapped to MARC format and the metadata was migrated to the main UBC library catalog. WIWA also uses First Nations House of Learning subject headings, which were created by founding librarian Jean Joseph. There are over 11,000 subject headings and they are available online for other institu institutions to use and to study. FNHL is recognized by the Library of Congress as an internationally authorized source and is fully indexed in the MARC 650 field with full subcode, subfield coding, which allows for both browsable indexes and faceted searching by subtopic. The library also uses an Aboriginal enhanced MARC record that provides instructions on recording Aboriginal creators, corporate bodies, languages, and dialects. This enhanced record improves access to the Aboriginal content because it allows for more accurate and detailed Indigenous metadata. Here on this slide, you can see the integration of WIWA's IKOS with established metadata and cataloging standards. On the left side of the screen, you see a list of the broad classes that make up the WIWA classification scheme. You can see the geographical grouping of the subdivisions, which allows them to maintain their connections instead of being scattered by the alphabet. At the top of the screen, you see the scheme's ability to become more granular. At the center of the slide, you see display from the online catalog. The WIWA collection is fully integrated with the UBC library catalog. This integration makes WIWA's collection more searchable and browsable, but it also connects Indigenous scholarship perspectives and resources to all academic disciplines. You can also note here the unique call numbers and the subject listings that reflect preferred terminology. On the right is a mark record of the source, where you can find the First Nations House of Learning thesaurus recorded in the 600 field. The 710 field is part of the Aboriginal Enhanced Mark Record. It is where significant Indigenous corporate bodies are entered. These components all work together to amplify WIWA's collection and ensure that it is accessible and valued. There's also more than one way to organize knowledge. Cataloging systems like Brian Deere's are great for organizing existing materials like those in libraries and archives, but you can also create new materials as a community and organize them like in Wikipedia. However, Wikipedia for Indigenous communities looks a lot different from the English Wikipedia we know. In fact, Indigenous Wiki projects are a great lens to view some of those considerations for Indigenous knowledge organization systems that we talked about earlier. There have been many attempts to create Wiki projects in Indigenous languages, but as I mentioned before, only those that were initiated within the community got a lot of support and involvement from community members. Some people start Indigenous wikis without working with the people who speak the language at all, so that's already not working out for that first consideration, which is who is involved in the project and who has a say. Two wiki projects that have succeeded in getting community support are Wikipedia Akitamek Nehiromoan and Nungarpedia. Both of these projects were deeply rooted in the communities that speak Nehiromoan in Canada and Nungar in Australia which you can see in the wealth of content created for them and the organization of the encyclopedias themselves. Both communities decided early on that some knowledge is protected and shouldn't be just freely available, for example, the locations of certain natural resources in Canada, and knowledge is sacred things in Australia. The Atika Meknehirovisu community also decided that you could cite an elder, or an oral history, as a source of information, which is completely different to the European tradition where written sources are the only reliable ones.
So by the Attica Mekuneheroisu and Noongar people getting involved in these projects, they were able to shape them to their own worldview. They decided how the information would be organized, who should get to use it, and what is considered an authoritative source. The organization of Noongarpedia also reflects how Noongar people organize the world, with a hierarchy whose top levels include country, ocean, and sky, as well as the dreaming, an aboriginal worldview that actually informs much of how Noongar and other aboriginal cultures organize their knowledge and emphasizes the importance of ancestors as the source of knowledge. The dreaming is also the source of many Noongar oral histories about their people and creation. Noongar culture has specific rules about knowledge protection, and thanks to Leonard Collard, a Noongar professor who helped build the project, protected cultural knowledge is not freely accessible on the wiki. This may sound like it conflicts with our own LIS values about freedom of information and access, but for people who experienced many other things taken away from them, upholding these cultural values is a way to reassert themselves in a world order that is largely Western-inspired. For the Atika Mek project, researchers and community leaders recruited high school students who speak Nehiro Moan natively to write articles for the wiki. This helped the wiki project reflect Atika Mek Neheroisu values by encouraging the teenagers to connect with older members of the community and use them as sources for the information in the articles, just as elders are considered authoritative sources of knowledge in the culture in general. It also kept the development of Wikipedia Atika Mek Nehiro Moan within the community, a system designed by and for its users. As a result, Wikipedia Atika Mek Nehiro Moan is one of the largest indigenous wiki projects in Canada, with over 1,400 articles. In addition to indigenous classification schemes, there are also subject heading lists and thesauri that have been created to deal with indigenous materials and indigenous forms of knowledge as a supplement to LCSH. As was said earlier, there's no one knowledge organization system that can represent all the various indigenous cultures. Therefore, indigenous subject headings tend to cater to one particular group or tribal nation, rather than trying to represent them all. Different collections will call for different lists, and therefore these subject heading lists in thesauri do not attempt to be universal. Here, we're going to focus on just two. The Manitoba Archival Information Network, or MAIN, subject headings, and the Maori Subject Headings Project, which created the Na Opoko Tukutuku thesaurus, both of which are freely available online. The Manitoba Archival Information Network, or MAIN, was created by the Association for Manitoba Archives to provide subject headings specifically for archival materials that pertain to Manitoba's indigenous communities. Their purpose is to, quote, devise and implement a strategy to replace LCSH terms in Maine that are considered culturally insensitive, specifically those terms pertaining to Manitoba's indigenous peoples, with terms that are more that more accurately reflect the identity of Manitoba's indigenous peoples. Ensure that the AMA does not perpetuate the culturally insensitive legacy of these LCSH terms via the descriptions in Maine, and ensure that the archival descriptions in Maine remain highly searchable and discoverable by using standardized subject terminology. In practice, this has meant changing terms such as Indians in LCSH to Indigenous peoples, using the names and terms that Indigenous communities use for self-identification, and deleting offensive or inappropriate terms. The intent of this work was to modify LCSH and improve it, rather than to offer an entirely distinct system, so the materials can still be broadly discoverable by a wide international audience using LC. Secondly, the Maori Subject Headings Project, which created the Naopoko Tukutuku, had a more radical approach, in that rather than changing LCSH, they offer a separate thesaurus. The goal of this thesaurus was to create subject access that more closely resembled the Maori worldview, where three aspects of the world, the people, the spiritual, and the mind, are intrinsically connected and related to one another. The main user of this thesaurus, the National Library of New Zealand, could apply a separate vocabulary of terms that pertain only to the Maori people, who are about 15% of the population of New Zealand. What you see on this slide is an example from the library. On the right, there is a page from the Naapoko Tukutuku for the Maori term wakapapa, which is a central term for the Maori worldview 
that doesn't directly translate into a single English word. Nonetheless, this is a term that is fundamental to the literature and scholarship of the Maori people and would be key for catalog access. You can see that in the thesaurus, there are multiple English terms from LCSH that Wakapapa replaces, including family history, genealogy, history, comma, family, kinship, and relationships. Wakapapa is a more precise topical term in Maori, even though it replaces numerous broad English terms. And because this is a thesaurus, you can see that there are narrower terms as well as related terms with terminology in both Maori and English, as well as a helpful scope note for those unfamiliar with a term. On the left is a screenshot from the catalog display of the subject access for an item in the National Library of New Zealand. You can see that the, four, the top four terms are all in LCSH, whereas the bottom five terms are from the Na'apoko Tukutuku. These five Maori terms are more appropriate for subject access than their English equivalents in the thesaurus would be. Therefore, they use the, the native terms. Nevertheless, there are still faceted LCSH terms where they are appropriate, in this case, for access to the relevant people and groups. So what you see here is a, a combination of different kinds of terminology that's still trying to provide access to a broader, greater community using LC. Indigenous knowledge organization systems offer many opportunities to revisualize and innovate the organization systems we use throughout our work, not just with indigenous materials, which highlights the importance of diverse perspectives in our profession. When we include diverse voices, we get new ways to look at the way we do things. For example, the Maori subject headings Ngā'upoko Tukutuku were named after a traditional Maori art form, Tukutuku, which is a type of woven latticework, as you can see in this picture of an artwork by Maori artist Sonia Snowden. This is just one way that different cultures can apply their understanding of the world to their knowledge organization systems. And although these systems might take more work to develop and implement on top of or in conjunction with mainstream knowledge organization systems like Library of Congress and the Dewey Decimal System, the reward for doing so is well worth it if we can more faithfully represent the materials we're describing and the individuals and cultures that created them. As LIS professionals, we have a duty to provide unbiased and responsible access to the materials in our care. Using Indigenous knowledge organization systems helps us reevaluate the Western biases inherent in the systems we use that encourage us to be less responsible towards Indigenous people. Living in a post-colonial world, Indigenous knowledge organization systems are just one of many steps we can take to decolonize our libraries and ensure that Indigenous voices are not drowned out by Eurocentric views. To help you learn more about Indigenous knowledge organization systems, we've put together a couple of handouts. Please take a look at the pamphlet Exploring Indigenous Knowledge Organization Systems, where we've put some links to the different knowledge organization systems we've talked about today so you can explore them, as well as links to some different professional associations, such as the American Indian Library Association, that focus on Indigenous issues in libraries. We hope these resources will help you consider the relationship between Indigenous people and LIS and incorporate more diverse views into your professional philosophy. Thank you.